I've been talking a lot about the imagination, and now before beginning segment five, I would like to share this quote with you by Eugene Peterson from his book Run with the Horses. The great masters of the imagination do not make things up out of thin air. They direct our attention to what is right before our eyes. They then train us to see it whole, not in fragments, but in context, with all the connections. They connect the visible and the invisible, the this with the that. They assist us in seeing what is around us all the time, but which we regularly overlook. With their help we see it not as commonplace, but as awesome, not as banal, but as wondrous. For this reason, the imagination is one of the essential ministries in nurturing the life of faith. For faith is not a leap out of the everyday, but a plunge into its depths. I hope this would be encouragement to you to begin to use your imagination. And uh, as I shared before, when I imagine heaven, I am only able to imagine the things that I've seen on earth but they're absolutely perfect and I can embellish on them. But it's a wonderful way to activate the imagination and, and to begin to develop this part of us that was mostly lost at the time of the fall, but that God wants to restore to us in these end times. In the previous segment we saw the true self come up out of hiding and immediately begin to go up to uh, have carnality cut away from him. And Tamar is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is being encouraged to use his imagination that in this way the Lord can begin to sever some of the carnality from him. Now let's go on here with verse 15. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot because she had covered her face. So this is a true self. He's been using his imagination to envision Christ. And uh, and then it says he thought her to be a harlot. The word thought here is kashab. And it means to imagine, to interpenetrate. So here again we have confirmation. This is about the imagination. There are 17 different Hebrew words that are translated thought in English. And some of them would have seemed more appropriate to use here. For example, he would he judged her to be a harlot, but that's not the word the Holy Spirit chose. Or he compared her to a harlot. Again, that's not what the Holy Spirit chose. The Holy Spirit chose a word that means to imagine and to interpenetrate. And when we begin to use our imagination righteously to envision Christ and heavenly things and to see ourselves in perfection, we begin to penetrate through the veils that separate the Lord from us. Now, what does it mean to think that uh, she's a harlot or to compare the Lord to a harlot? A harlot is someone that men use to meet their needs. And unfortunately, this is the way most of us come to the Lord. We come to Him expecting him to meet our needs. We come be, because we have a need. We've got some trial in our life, uh, something that we really need help with, and so we come to God so he can help us. And, uh, and yet God wants us to bring us beyond that. He doesn't want us to come to him just to use him to meet our desires. So the harlot represents our inferior concept of God that he is there to meet our needs and we usually turn to him as I said before when we've got problems in life but uh, God wants more than that from us he understands that in our humanness and in our weakness that we're going to go to him because we have needs and when trials come upon us we want to be delivered from these trials and we don't understand that God wants to come to us in the midst of our trials. And he wants us to trust in him and lean on him to take us through the trial. It was in a terrible trial in my life that I first learned that God really does hear my prayers. I grew up in a Christian family and I said my prayers every night. But I wasn't sure that God really heard my prayers until a devastating uh trial came into my life. 
I was 21 years old. My father was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor that was terminal. My mother was already suffering from terminal cancer. And uh, my husband was going to be going to Vietnam in a few months with the Marine Corps. And it was just a very, very difficult time in my life. But God did some things, some very special things for me and my family during that time that I knew were not just coincidences. And I could see that God really knew me. He knew our situation, and he was there to help us. And uh, so in the midst of my trial, that's where I found God. And I think a lot of us find him in that way. My parents both died of cancer, and uh, my husband went to Vietnam, but he came home okay, and life went on. But it, during that experience, I learned I have to know God, because life can be hard. Up to that point, I thought life was really great, but I found out life can be very difficult, and I need to know God, and that's when I decided to pursue him. So out of my trial uh, came some very good things in my life. but. Uh, God wants uh, to bring us to the place where instead of uh, just wanting something from him that we would desire to know him for himself and that takes maturity that's not where most of us begin but God will bring us into that place now Judah here represents someone that wants this oneness with God he wants to be perfected but he doesn't want to uh, die for the Lord or perhaps he doesn't know that that's what God requires but when there is to be a depth of relationship Christ already died for us and he wants us to die for him not literally in our physical body but uh, to die to self for him Ephesians 5:25 says husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it and so in a good marriage a husband and a wife both are willing to lay down their own selfish desires for the other person in that way um, they both find joy and they find a good marriage but when a man goes to a harlot he doesn't want to have any responsibility he's not willing to uh, give up anything of his own life he just wants his needs gratified and so that's what the type means here uh, comparing Christ to a harlot in our allegory it means going to God for what we want from him not for who he is and with and we go without wanting to make a commitment what is it that God wants for himself what does God really want from us well being the loving father that he is he wants children that will love him in return and he wants us to love him for who he is not for what he does and uh, this is a message that doesn't build big churches um, most of the time. People are very attracted to a gospel message that says, Come to the Lord for what He can do for you. He wants to meet your needs. He wants to take your trials away. And He wants to make your life smooth and wonderful. But it doesn't always go that way. In fact, if you're really pursuing the Lord with all of your heart, I don't think it does go that way. But that was a very strong message um, a few decades ago when my husband and I were struggling uh, as, as we were raising our children in the church and my husband was the pastor of the church and uh, it just seemed like no matter what we did for the Lord, no matter how, how hard we pursued him, the blessing that we were seeking from him always eluded us and it seemed like pastors all around us could build big churches and and they could have a good living and things went well for them and it just seemed like everything we touched crumbled but in the midst of that God brought a wonderful mentor and friend our way in the man Devern Fromke his wonderful books and he happened to live near us and uh, he helped us to see that the question is what does God want for himself? He wants many sons and daughters just like Jesus. And you know, Jesus loved his father with a perfect love. He loved him so much that he was willing to die for him. 
and so in the midst of our trials when it seemed blessing always eluded us we asked the question what does god want for himself in this and we learned that god wanted us to love him through it not because of the blessing that he gave us but because of who he is and that our mission in life was not to build big successful churches but our mission in life was to please god and to bless him you know it's easy to love god when everything's going well and you're feeling really blessed but when everything's falling apart and you can love god in the midst of it and say god it doesn't matter what's happening here all around me what really matters is that uh, you love me and i love you and I'm going to obey you, and I trust you, God, that at some point you're going to achieve your purpose through my life. And I know that it's going to be like it was with Job. There, After Job lost everything, Lord, you restored everything to him and even more, and we believe you're going to do that for us. And so this sustained us through some really difficult trials in life. And I just thank God for that. I thank God that we didn't have the blessings that we were wanting at the time and I thank God that he gave us what was really important we always had a deep uh, word from God he always opened the scriptures to us and he shared his heart with us and um, we never lost a child we always had a roof over our heads we always had food to eat and and so God blessed and God's word to us is come and follow not come and be blessed so I can give you everything but come and follow you know the disciples left everything to follow Jesus they left their occupations behind they left their families and their homes and they followed the Lord wherever he led and there's a scripture in Psalm 106 that I think says it all regarding the dangers of coming to God uh, just for what he can give us says there in verse 15 and he gave them their request but sent leanness to their soul and so I just thank God that he did not give us our requests and we did not have the leanness of soul but God gave us the richness of his word and his love and his presence and led us into a maturity that we would never have had had we received all the blessings we were asking for he gave us what really counted the most Let's finish up verse 15 here. We've already talked about how Judah began using his imagination and he came to God as someone who could meet his needs. And the final clause here is because she had covered her face. Uh, God, so to speak, has covered his face. We don't really know him. And that's because we can only see according to what's in our own heart. But when we begin using our imagination, we start by hoping to get our needs met and uh, that's what I did I began to visualize back in 1997 uh, the Lord encouraged me to begin visualizing him and uh, I had a friend that had a lot of visions and I didn't have visions and the Lord encouraged me through her to begin to use my imagination and uh, that he wanted to develop my imagination that I had shut mine down many years ago uh, because I thought I'd get in trouble if I used my imagination and so I didn't use it and he wanted me to start activating it and he encouraged me to go to him for the healing of hay fever and so that's what I did I began going to the Lord every time my nose was running and I was sneezing I my situation in life was such that I could go be alone with the Lord when this happened and I visualized being with him in a beautiful heavenly place and uh, I, at that time I had been studying uh, Ezekiel 47 about the river that flowed out from the throne and that it was um, everything in it lived everything in it was healed and so I would imagine being in that river with Jesus and I would talk over scriptures with him I memorized healing scriptures and or I would met, imagine myself in a meadow with uh, flowers and trees and grass and pollen flying everywhere and because I was with the Lord it didn't bother me and it would get better it would I might have to do that a few times a day but each time I went to be alone with the Lord the hay fever did improve 
and now many years later I don't have hay fever anymore which is a tremendous blessing and I don't believe it just happened I believe it's because God has been working in my life and he's done a lot of things for me uh, and through visualization I've come to know him and experience his presence and so God understands that when we start using our imagination we're going to come to him to get our needs met but he's going to take us beyond that into a deeper maturity where we begin to visualize uh, relationships with him a relationship with him much more than getting our needs met we saw in the previous slides that Judah as a type of the person in the end times is coming to the Lord to get his needs met but we see here that something happens as he is visualizing the Lord and spending time with him and that is that he begins to turn uh, part a of verse 38 16 and he turned unto her by the way the word turned here in the Hebrew is nata it means to bend away including a moral deflection and so he is bending away from his concept of going to God for what he can get from him and he is beginning to have a higher vision of the Lord he's living out of Colossians 3 if ye then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God set your affection on things above not on things on the earth for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God when Christ who is our life shall appear then shall you also appear with him in glory so when you take time every day to visualize the Lord and you go to him with your needs eventually you're going to find that you're setting your affection on things above not on things of the earth because you just can't spend that much time with the Lord and seek him that intently without changing and gradually over time we come so that we're not so interested in getting our needs met as we are in knowing God uh, one other scripture comes to mind it's 2 Corinthians 4.18 while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal and that is a change that comes about in us we begin to see so much of life around us that we thought was so very important is really temporal and it's passing away but what really matters what's really important is the Lord and our relationship with him and so we begin be, begin to cast these other things aside continuing on with the same verse and Judas says go to I pray thee and let me come in unto thee for he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law so he's wanting here to become one with the Lord and yet he still does not see God for who he is and remember a daughter-in-law we looked at this before in the Hebrew it means a bride as perfect so it's a type of perfection so he's wanting to come into perfection but still he can only see according to his own heart and even though our motives are not pure in what we desire of uh, coming into perfection the Lord wants this oneness too and of course his motives are always perfect as I was thinking about this verse and the oneness that I know the Lord desires for us to have with him I was reminded of John 17:20, where Jesus is praying and he's saying to his father neither pray I for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me so here we see Jesus praying for this oneness but his motive is perfect look here that the world may believe that thou hast sent me so this is how the world is going to be one uh, for the Lord when we become one with him and one with one another let's go on and read and he says and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one even as we are one and so God is going to be glorified in this way 
when the believers become one with the Lord, they're going to become one with each other. And the glory of God is going to be seen in his body of people as we come into this oneness. Going on with John 17, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So when the church comes into this perfection, when we become one with the Lord and we have this oneness in purpose and character and nature, then the world is going to see that Jesus does love them and Jesus died for them. And so we see here that Jesus' motives in his prayer are much higher than ours. And yet he's going to bring us up into the place where our motive and his motive become one. Our verse finishes up here with Tamar, who in type is the Lord, asking, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? So the Lord is saying, If you want to come into this oneness and the perfection that you're desiring, you're going to have to give up some things for me. And we become aware that as we pursue God here, that our lives cannot go on as they always have. For one thing, there are only 24 hours in a day. We still have to sleep. We still have work to do. And uh, we just can't fit in all the leisure time activities we had and continue on progressing with the Lord in prayer and the Word, which we're going to want more and more of those as we continue seeking Him. And we're going to want more time for visualizing and so we can't just keep on doing all the things we've been doing. Something's going to have to give here. It's either going to be our time with the Lord or some other worldly thing that we have been used to participating in. And we'll see in the next verse uh, just exactly how this works. Here in this verse we see what Judah is willing to give up in order that he can have this oneness with the Lord. It says, And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? So what does it mean spiritually that he's willing to give a kid from the flock? The word kid in Hebrew is geri, and it means a young goat from browsing. Now, we know that goats have a reputation that they'll eat anything. I remember when I was a child taking piano lessons, I had a song called Bill Grogan's Goat. And that goat would eat anything, and he ate the laundry off of the line, the clothesline, in this little song. So they're not very discriminating about what they're going to eat. And sometimes we are like that in the things that we are willing to taste of the world. And uh, we browse. We'll go from one thing to another, do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, like uh, channel surfing, surfing the internet. Perhaps we have hobbies and crafts that we like to dabble in. But we're going to come to the place uh, where we're willing to give these up because we've got a glimpse of Christ here. We see something that we want that's worth giving up everything we have. And so he's willing to change some of the things he's doing in order to have more time to spend with the Lord. Now this kid was from the flock. A lot of things God is going to be asking us to give up are things that everybody else is doing. It's not that these things are bad in and of themselves. It's just that for us they become sin because of what we have seen of the Lord and because just for the fact that they take up our time and we can't use our time the way we used to use our time because God wants all of our time for himself and so we have to give up all of these things and he's willing to do this at this point point. and so the question the Lord asks is give me a pledge and the word pledge is arabon in the Hebrew and it means an exchange God wants to do an exchange here. He wants us to exchange our life for his life. And uh, that sounds like he's asking us to give up an awful lot. But what we get back 
is so much more than anything that we gave the Lord. In the next verse, the Lord is going to be telling us more specifically what, he is, what it is he wants us to give him. In the previous verse, we saw what Judah was willing to give up to the Lord. And it was something outward, things that he does with his time, pursuits that he enjoys doing. But we'll see here that the Lord is going to ask for something far deeper. And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet, and thy bracelets, and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her, and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. So let's look at the three items that she wanted. The bracelets, and the signet, and the staff. First, the signet. The signet was a ring that had to do with a man's identity, probably had something on it having to do with his family and his social status. It was something that he could uh, drip wax on a parchment and press the ring into it and everyone would know that that was his, his signet and that it definitely did come from him. So there is something having to do with identity, the family that we're from, and our status in life that we derive from our family. These are things that we're going to have to give up to the Lord. That doesn't mean we have to forsake our family or anything like that. But if we find a sense of identity through our family, then that has to go. We can still have our family, but we're not finding our identity in it. The bracelets, from the study I did on what the bracelets could possibly be, there were no definitive answers, but it was probably uh, some wool that had been loosely formed into a kind of yarn that the shepherd wore around his wrist. And these strands of yarn were what held his headdress on his head. You know, in the warm climate, they would have like a, a, a piece of cloth over their head to shield them from the sun, and they needed something to hold it in place. So that's probably what that was, a piece of wool to hold that in place. So we're looking here at occupation. And we look to our occupation often for our identity and also for security. It is through the work that we do that we earn money and that is a sense of security for us. So God is saying, give up the identity you have in your occupation and trust me with your security that I will meet all your needs. And the staff, the staff was something that a shepherd used to control his sheep. And so I see that as a willingness to give up control over our own life, that we're willing to trust God with the control of our life. So we see here that God is striking very deep into our hearts the things that really matter to us, having to do with our identity and our security and control over our own life. And he wants us to give all these things up to him. And Judah, here this type of the person in the end times who knows who he is, has found his true self, is willing to give up all of this in order to have this oneness with the Lord and to come into perfection in Christ. I'd like to make just a couple of further comments on what I said about family and occupation. Sometimes we do have to give up our family. If our family is evil, and uh, I know several people who have had to give up their family of origin because it was an evil family. But uh, for me, giving up a family meant that I was not able to live near my children and my grandchildren. And uh, sometimes that is what we have to give up for the Lord. But the Lord himself is so fulfilling that, and he makes ways for us to be together in the day, in this time of Skype and internet and cell phones, we can still be close, even though we're not geographically close. And also about occupation, we don't necessarily have to leave our job, but sometimes God does call us to leave our job. We don't really know how God's going to work this out in our life, but whether it happens just in our heart or, ac or outwardly in our actions, we do have to let go of all of these things and trust the Lord with our life completely. In the first part of this verse, 
Judah has been willing to give to the Lord everything God has asked of him. These are deep concerns of his heart, his identity, his security, the control of his life. He's trusting God with all of these things. And as a result of that, the Lord is taking him into an experience of great depth that has been reserved for the church of the end times. He's entered into an experience here that no Christian, no matter how great or how dedicated to God, could have experienced in past ages because it's only the church of the end times that gets to experience this. The type here is very deep um, because we're speaking of a woman conceiving a child by a man. And we know that God is totally masculine. He is Father, He is Son, and He is the coming Bridegroom. But yet, God brings forth life of all things. All life has come forth out of God. And so what is happening here is that Judah is the one who's going to be born. And this word conceived here, uh, I see it as a quickening. When a woman conceives a child, she's not very far into her pregnancy before she begins to feel movement in her womb. And in this account, Judah is the one who begins to feel movement. He feels it all over his body because he is starting to experience the quickening of his mortal body. We read about this in Romans 8:11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. And when we have this quickening, we feel it in our body. This happened to me in February of 1997 when the Lord came to me in a very special way and I felt the quickening of my body. It started in my feet and came up my legs into the trunk of my body and my arms and I began to feel the most wonderful feeling of kind of a wave-like motion almost like a deep massage, but not on the skin, down inside the body, which is very difficult to explain, but a feeling of being deeply loved. And from that time, I have felt as though I were floating in my mother's womb. I feel it at all times. I'm sitting here uh, doing this teaching, looking at my slide that I have made, and I'm very much here on the earth, but at the same time, I feel this wonderful motion as though I were floating in my mother's womb. And that's how I was able to understand what this meant here. Also, it fits into the next verse. And without understanding this part of this verse, we would not be able to make sense of the verse that follows. But this is the first step in this mortal putting on immortality and this is the quickening of the mortal body and it has to do with the awakening of the spiritual body I know that this is my spiritual body which is inside of my natural body I have teach a, a very extensively about this in my book the four living creatures and also in another teaching on my website entitled the second coming of Christ revealed in Jacob's twelve sons. So Judah is the one that's going to be born here. He's going to come forth in this new life in Christ. And this is what God wants every believer to experience in the end times. He wants to come to each one of us and quicken our mortal bodies. And he wants to continue working in our lives until he brings us forth into newness of one unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So in the previous verse, Judah has had this wonderful experience 
reserved for true Christians in the end times of the quickening of his mortal body. Uh, the Lord has come to him in a very special way. The spiritual body is awakened and the mortal body is feeling the quickening. And the Lord is just filling him and filling him with more and more of his spirit and his presence is going stronger and stronger. And when this happened to me, I was just basking in this wonderful, wonderful experience. The Lord told me not to talk about it, and so I couldn't really share it with anyone else. But it was just the most marvelous feeling, although I did have one prophetic friend that I could talk with about this, who had been prophesying to me all along various things about what God was going to be doing in my life. And so she began to prophesy to me, uh, saying that I was going to go through a time of suffering. The Lord called it my final cross. I was going to have this difficult experience. And during this time, the Lord's presence would leave me. He would not really leave me, but I would no longer feel this wonderful presence. And that was very disturbing to me. And not only did this friend prophesy this to me, but another friend in another state, when we had were visiting friends in another state, uh, another prophet prophesied to me that I was going to go through this time of suffering, this very difficult experience, but that God was with me, even though I would feel that he wasn't. And so that's what this verse is about. It says here, And she arose and went away, and laid by her veil from her, and put on the garments of her widowhood. So, if, and she arose, we literally feel the Lord rising in us uh, perceptively when we have this experience of the quickening of the mortal body and we feel God's presence. We feel his touch. It is a wonderful thing. But with the final cross, that feeling goes away. And during this time, the Lord will strip away many veils of our flesh. That's what it means by laid by her veil. The Lord will be stripping many of the veils of our carnality away during this time. And yet, and the Lord will seem that he's very far away and inaccessible. And that's what garments of widowhood meant in our type. That um, a widow is not accessible by a suitor when she has on garments of widowhood. So this is symbolically saying that Christ seems very far away and inaccessible. But he really isn't. And so when I had two prophetic words that I was going to suffer and I was going to lose this marvelous feeling of the Lord's presence, I was very disturbed by that. I cried about it. Just about every day I would have tears about this. The thought of what I was feeling leaving me was just almost more than I could bear. And I really think that the God did a lot of stripping away the veils of my flesh just with my anticipating that he was going to leave me. And I didn't have this uh, final cross experience for a number of years after it was prophesied to me. I don't remember how many years, four or five perhaps. And then when I went through it, it was very quick. He said it would be quick. There was no doubt of what I experienced. I, I knew when I was going through it, it was the final cross. And uh, and then when I came through on the other side, I could tell I was different and that some veils had been stripped away from me and that I was looking at life differently now. And the Word of God was opening up more and more before me. And... Uh, I was so thankful when that experience was behind me. And I know that God is going to be bringing this into the lives of many, many believers here. Very shortly, we have some very difficult things to face in our world and in our uh, our nation here in America. And uh, as we go through these things, God is going to be coming to his, his people. And he's going to be quickening them. And they're going to begin to feel his presence in a way far deeper than they ever dreamed possible.